So, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about the Bible is that it does not uh, shy away from talking about difficult uh, or some of the most difficult and, and hardest issues of life. And uh, they may be painful or controversial or shocking, um, but, and sometimes the culture or our, the churches shy away from talking about it, but the Bible doesn't, and oftentimes it goes out of its way to talk about issues such as rape, um, homosexuality, infertility, incest, racism, slavery, and the issue that we're going to be tackling today is the issue of disabilities. The ADA defines disabil a person with disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment uh, that substantially limits one or more major life activity. We oftentimes uh, think of disabilities as uh, disabilities of movement, of sight, of, of hearing, or speech, but disability can also uh, be that of mental, intellectual, or learning disabilities, and oftentimes they're unnoticed by the public. But disabilities can include things such as autism, mental health, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, cerebral palsy, anxiety disorder, and so much more. And it permeates all around us, and it, it, it will touch our lives, whether you realize it or not. Uh, a mom of two children with disabilities, Ellen Stumble, writes this. It happens. It really is that simple. Babies are born with disabilities. Sometimes disability is discovered later in life. Sometimes disability happens as a re result of an accident. Often, disability comes along with old age. All of us, in some way and at some point in life, will be impacted by disability. Disability does not discriminate against race, religion, culture, social class, or how, many, how much money you have in the bank. It can happen to anyone. Anyone. The good news is that the scripture is not silent on the issue. And in fact, Jesus goes out of his way to interact and have relationship with those who are struggling with disability. And so if you have not done so yet, would you turn with me to John chapter 9? The Gospel of John chapter 9, it's a long story, but we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4 and just focus there. The ESV reads this way, and as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. I want us to look at the story in three ways. Seeing, questioning, and understanding. Seeing, questioning, and understanding. It begins in verse 1, as he, Jesus, passed by, he saw not a child, not a baby, but a man blind from birth. This was a man who, um, who had lived his whole life with a disability. And we find out in verse 18 um, that his parents were around. And I'm sure that the parents took care of this little boy when he was a boy or an infant. But for some reason, now that this uh, person was a full-grown adult, they are not with him. In fact, uh, in verse 8, we learn that the neighbor's uh, had learned, had gotten used to him as the man who would be on the streets begging. And so he had become a beggar in the neighborhood. And, you know, we can try to spiritualize it all that we want, but for the person with a disability, life can be difficult. I don't want to try to pretend, nor should any of us pretend to understand or empathize with uh, the unique disability that someone may have. I was meeting with a, a leader this week, a, a pastor, 
And I didn't think much of the meeting. I thought he was a high profile, a competent individual. And then we began to talk about health issues. And he shared with me of a medical condition that he has been struggling with the last couple of years. And he said that it is now, only now that he, can be, he is beginning to understand people with chronic pain and depression. And that he, it was something that he just didn't quite get. That, that there would be months where, where pain would just be a part of his life that would debilitate him to the point where he, he couldn't focus in front of the screen to finish his sermon. So the night before, he would have to call a friend and say, hey, can you preach for me? I just cannot do this. And how his medication uh, that alleviates the pain uh, would do a work in his mind. And he began to fall into depression. And uh, he would have these dark thoughts that was not him, he thought. And he began to understand how debilitating it is. A disability, by definition, is, is something that um, uh, takes an ability and disables it in some ways. It prevents us from functioning fully. Jesus, as he was walking by, sees this man, you know, and the word, uh, we might think in, in the same way in the parable of the Good Samaritan, where a Levite and a priest sees a man who was injured, and they saw him, but what they do was they go out of their way to avoid contact. In fact, the, the parable says that they went across the street so they, don't, they wouldn't have to interact with him. But Jesus saw this man born blind, and instead of avoiding him, he initiates contact. He initiates a relationship. It is interesting if you think about, and if you've been in the church for a little bit, and if you ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the kind of interaction, the kind of relationships that Jesus initiates he gravitates toward the blind, the bleeding, and the bedridden. You know, if he was alive today, I don't know if Jesus would spend uh, most of his time like a lot of the modern Christian leaders who would speak at, at large conferences and want to increase their influence by spending time with leaders only. And in fact, if Jesus was ministering today, I, I think he would oftentimes gravitate toward the the ministry toward the special needs. One of my favorite stories of Jesus is when he was walking um, to an appointment with an influential leader who had an employee who was sick, and in the midst of a crowd, he stopped and he said, who touched me? And a woman who had been hemorrhaging for years, uh, she, she cowards and, and his disciples said, what do you mean who touched you? There's, there's a crowd around you. And Jesus stops and pauses and spends time with this woman. And he calls her by a title that, that he rarely if ever does. And he calls her daughter. As if to say, I, I see you, I hear you, I know you. Oftentimes, out of awkwardness or out of a discomfort, we avoid the topic or we don't know quite what to do. These are words of some of those who are struggling with disabled. And, and one estimate uh, says that one in five people in the United States and one billion people in the world uh, struggle with some sort of a disability. Cassie wrote, it's okay to ask questions. In fact, I welcome them. I would rather you take the opportunity to be educated than just stare at me. Karen writes, our lives are different. Don't dismiss how someone feels by saying it could always be worse or at least you don't have this or that. I'm allowed to feel what I feel and that's grief and sadness and anxiety and uncertainty a lot. It's also happiness, joy, pride, appreciation for inch stones, immeasurable love. Jeff confesses it's incredibly lonely and isolating. Sue writes, there is no vacation from disability. 
And Christine writes, having a disability does not define you, though. Jesus saw, and that caused the disciples around him to finally notice, and they saw. And they raise a question. It is, a, in some ways, an insensitive but a brutally honest question. They ask Jesus, Rabbi, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And as insensitive and as uh, perhaps um, politically incorrect that question may have been, it is the question that we all ask internally. In fact, it is the question that the blind man has been asking his whole life. It's the question his parents have been asking, and the question is why? Why did God allow this child that's born with autism, a woman learns that she is losing her sight because of an irreversible uh, condition, a young man filled in the potential of his life uh, experiences a trauma that leaves him in a wheelchair. The theist, the Christian, asks God, God, why have you allowed this? If you are an all-powerful, loving God, why? The non-Christian or the atheist asks the same question, but they ask uh, the cosmic cold vacuum, why? And their question echoes back at them in hollowness. If God is an all-powerful, loving God, why would God allow this chronic pain and suffering? It's the same question that Job's friends asked. It must have been something that you've done. It must have been your sin. It is your fault, Job. And as much as we don't want to directly insinuate this, but listen, the church and all of us together, we indirectly make the same statement. And this is how we do it. Because when we say God uh, is blessing me through our ability and through our health, and we say that these are the markers of God's blessing, what does it communicate to those who have less an ability or less of a health? That they are no longer experiencing God's blessing by God's curse, or are they being punished in some way? But this man was born uh, blind from birth. So the disciples uh, are, are reasoning perhaps it's not his fault, but perhaps it's the fault of his parents. Christians and non-Christians, theists and uh, atheists, harbor the, sel- the same self-condemning thoughts. Perhaps It was something that I ate that I should not have eaten while I was pregnant. Perhaps I I, I worked too hard. I should have rested. And and God forbid, this is the question that some parents uh, struggle with. Perhaps it was a mistake to have this child. And they spend the rest of their lives knowing that even after they pass, their child would struggle with this, uh, with this thought and this guilt in them. Listen, if there is no God, there is no good answer to this question. There is no real cause, and this man born blind is a result of a random accident, and he will just suffer, and there is no rhyme or reason. Or, If there is no God, there is a person to blame that that the parents perhaps should not have had the child. And they should feel guilt. If there is no God, there is really no purpose or reason behind disabilities. In fact, if you think about it, uh, all of science tells us that in the theory of evolution or natural selection that those who are more abled in society should procreate and, and, and make the uh, species better, more survivable, and those with less abilities should no longer procreate. Natural selection kind of dictates that 
those with disabilities are less useful to the community. Without God, there is no purpose. There is no compassion. And the disciples were asking this question that many people harbor uh, subtly in their hearts. But that is not what Jesus says, and he gives an understanding to them and to us in verse 3. Jesus answered, it, is, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. He is saying clearly the disability was not, was not the result of the man's sins or the parent's sin. Let me pause here. Jesus is not saying that suffering uh, did not come into the world because of sin. In fact, the scripture is clear that pain and suffering exists in this world because of sin. Genesis and Romans makes that clear to us. And in fact, we are told in Revelation that there will be a restoration of all things that the blind will see, the lame will walk. There will be no pain, no death, no suffering. But what Jesus is saying is this, that by and large in most uh, parts, that specific suffering is not a result of specific sins. Okay? Specific suffering is not the result of specific sins. Sins. We can try to figure out why or what is the cause, but the cause is not what Jesus answered, but he gives a more meaningful answer to the disciples' question. He does not give us the cause of suffering, but the purpose of suffering. Jesus says that the suffering of that man, and as an extension, many, many others who suffer from lifelong infirmities, that the suffering is a, exists that the works of God might be displayed in him. That somehow the God's glory may be displayed in that person, in the suffering. Jesus declares in verse 5 that he is the light of the world. He spits on the dirt, makes clay, applies it to the man, says go wash it in the pool. He comes back and he sees uh, the man has a debate with the religious leaders and, and the religious leaders are questioning him. He says, no, this man did this. What, what can I say? They cast him out and he comes back to Jesus and they talk. And at the end we find him in verse 38, Lord, I believe, and this man worships him. And so this encounter with Jesus results in worship, glory, a proclamation of who Jesus is. And that's fine, and, and we know of many people who are healed and they give glory to God, whether through supernatural means or through medicine. But what about all those who are never healed? What about all the, the prayers of parents who plead desperately for their child, but there's nothing but silence. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 17, oh, verses 7 and 8. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. You know, we don't know what this particular thorn was. Uh, many commentators believe it was some sort of a physical uh, uh, infirmity. In Galatians chapter 6, 11, Paul says that, see what large letters I am writing with my own hand, speculating that, uh, that Paul was beginning to lose his sight. Although we're not quite sure what it is, one of the things that we are sure of is that Paul, who was an apostle, the writer of uh, so many of the books of the New Testament, who healed others, pleaded, not just casually prayed, pleaded three times with the Lord to heal him of this thorn. But there was silence. And so the conclusion that Paul comes to in, in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 is this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God was glorified in healing, and God 
is glorified in waiting. What Paul is saying is this, his conclusion that his greatest delight is not to be fully able. It would be nice in this life to be fully able. Rather, his greatest delight is to be loved by God and his delight, his identity, and his value comes not in his ability, but in his love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Johnny Erickson Tata, um, and, and she is someone that you ought to become familiar with. She lives not far from here. Uh, was in a diving accident at the age of 17. She wrote of her disability. Yes, I pray that my pain might be removed, that it might cease. It is the prayer of anyone, any parent. But more so, I pray for the strength to bear it, the grace to benefit from it, and the devotion to offer it up to God as a sacrifice of praise. My weakness, that is, my quadriplegia, is my greatest asset because it forces me into the arms of Christ every single morning when I get up. And what Johnny Erickson Tata is saying is that in her weakness, she has no choice but to learn to be weak and, and fall into the arms of her, Jesus Christ. And Christ is someone of all the people, one who can sympathize with our weaknesses. If there was a person who had to lay aside their ability and become less able, that it was God who laid aside his godhood in order to become man. And not just any man, but one who has suffered at the hands of man. Johnny also wrote that God wrote a book on suffering, and its name is Jesus. If there is no God, there is no answer to the why, and there is no hope. But we do have a God, and he reminds us in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me to together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, you saw, uh, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them we are assured that you are not an accident that our wholeness or our lack of wholeness was not an accident our loving God our sovereign God uh, was there when we were formed knitted together in our mother's womb And in Romans 8, 28, we are told and we know that for those who love God, all things, not just the good things, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Whether the disability is a result of birth, an accident, uh, or age, God is uh, one, the one who orchestrated it or allows it for his glory and for our good and knowing this, uh, infinite loving God is greater than all. We delight in his plan and his love. And Johnny, uh, I will just end with this quote, wrote, I'd rather be in this wheelchair knowing God than on my feet without him. Realizing that really it is not our ability that allows us to, to be whole, but it is being connected and forgiven and loved by God that makes us whole. You know, I, I, what I appreciate about this series is not just the teaching, but we get to hear uh, talks and, and stories from those who've lived it. I have many points of contact uh, with Stephanie Chung, who will be giving her testimony today. She is she raised a son, uh, um, um, Joe, and she wrote about his life story. And by the way, um, she, um, Stephanie and her family donated a, a case of the books. And um, they will be outside. And, and, and Stephanie will be there if you want to 
uh, her to sign it or anything of that nature. Uh, she said, but you know, I want to donate it, but if you want to maybe uh, use it as a, a sell it for a fundraiser or something. So what we decided to do, we, we, you know, we're just so grateful. Um, we're asking for maybe a $10 donation so it will, be, it will go toward the, the college winter retreat scholarship fund. Um, but I have many points of contact with Stephanie, uh, and sometimes I talk about the Korean church that I grew up in and whose pastor I didn't really understand. Um, that's her father-in-law. <laughs> he will be here at third service. <coughs> the youth director, the, the pastor's son who drove us around to, allow, uh, to play basketball and, and, and bought me chatting, and that's her husband. <laughs> the person who sat me down and introduced me to Jesus Christ in the moment that I became a Christian, that's her uh, brother-in-law. Uh, a bunch of years ago, uh, their daughter Esther uh, attended our church when she was a student at Claremont. And her son Samuel was an intern at Living Hope and is now uh, pastoring out with Tim Pack out in Seattle. Uh, we're so grateful for Stephanie and, and her and her husband flew down here from Vancouver just to be here with us. Uh, you know, at, at the first service, we were just like half of us were, were, were crying. But Stephanie, would you come give us your story? Good morning, Living Hope. Uh, it is so good to see everybody here uh, this morning. Um, thank you for inviting me to share my testimony. I'm so humbled and honored. Uh, Living Hope has been dear to my heart. Uh, because, like um, Pastor Steve said, um, my son was a pastoral intern here, and now he is a past he is a pastor in Seattle, Washington. And also, um, uh, I have a, such a pre uh, precious memories of uh, Pastor Steve's mother. Uh, we was together in the Bible studies, and I remember she was an example of being faithful to her Lord and was a true prayer warrior. That was back about 30 years ago when I lived in Los Angeles. Um, anyway, I'm, I, even though I lived in North America for a long time, um, I still have a struggling in English language, so please be understanding. Um, I was born into a Christian family, and when I was about to graduate from university, uh, I had an arranged marriage. Uh, that happened in just one week after I met my husband. Pretty quick. <laughs> Few months later, I immigrated to the uh, United States. So, to be frank with you, I didn't date my husband long enough, only one week. <laughs> so, um, uh, enough to fall in love with him. So things were a bit awkward between me and my husband at the beginning. Can you imagine the, how difficult it must have been to settle in a brand new country and where I couldn't speak the language with a man I hardly knew? Then I became pregnant. I was so happy. Nine months later, my son was born. He was a healthy boy and furthermore, he was so handsome. But uh, soon after, my son fell victim to a medical malpractice that resulted in severe brain damage. Why God? Why allow this thing to happen to me? When I first received the diagnosis of autism, it felt as if the sky were falling on me. When Joseph was young, he was extremely hyperactive. He didn't sleep at the nighttime and daytime. So every day was a battle. Everyone, anyone here who has a family members with disabilities will understand what I'm talking about. As my son grew older, his future seemed very bleak. I started doubting whether God really existed. So everything around me was swallowed up in darkness. I am sorry, I am sorry. It's something that I have to say again and again. 
because of all the accidents and trouble that my son caused. Raising a child is difficult enough, but raising a child is, with a special needs is extra challenging. When Joseph went to puberty, through puberty, he had another problems. He began to have uh, epileptic seizures. We tried many different medications, but his, his epilepsy couldn't be controlled. As a mom, I felt helpless, and I only could do I just watching him to until the finish the seizures. It is so painful to see, go through. Sometimes he had a se- seven or eight times seizures per night. I was so painful t- to see that. I cried and prayed, oh Lord, we can live with this autism, but please heal his epilepsy. Because as long as we can accept his autism, his behavior, we can live with that, but um, epilepsy could be very dangerous. So, and then he collapsed with his seizures unpredictably any time, any places. So it was so, so painful that I just cried out to the Lord. Lord, please heal, heal his epilepsy. But no, it's, there's silence. And then about that time, I heard the sermon from a pastor talking about how God has a plan for, ev- plan for everybody. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So right, God has a plan for Joseph. So there is a hope. Anytime Joseph had a seizure, I would meditate and meditate over and over on this verse. And then somehow it was imprinted in my heart and on my mind. God's word was so powerful. I began to have a peace in my heart. I still, to pr- I, I, at that time I started to pray that, oh God, this boy is, this Joseph is not mine but yours. Please, you raise him through your will, your plan, your purpose. So every time Joseph fell and then had a seizure, and after woke up from the seizures, I gave thanks to the Lord. Oh Lord, you gave, me, you gave him a new day. So through Joseph, God taught me how precious each day was. I praise the Lord. If I didn't have a Joseph, I might not have understood this message. And a few years later, we moved to Vancouver, Canada. I had an opportunity to perform a concert. So prior to the concert, Media interviews had been scheduled for the uh, promotional purposes. During the interview, I had happened to tell to the reporter that I have a son who has a, I'm sorry, who has a son uh, with a special needs. But he's a true blessing to me. After the newspaper newspaper article came out, I received a phone call from a young mom who had a special needs child. She wanted to talk to me so desperately. Just hearing the pain in her voice made my heart break because I knew how difficult it was to raise a child, disabled child in a foreign country with no friends and no relatives. 
the moment we met, instantly bonded, we understood where we were coming from. We shared and prayed for each other and had Bible studies. Other moms began to join us. One day, one of the moms said to me, Oh, Stephanie, I thought my son's disability was due to, due to the sins of my past. And so I already struggled with guilt and pain. She was a Buddhist. But after reading the scripture, I became clear to her that her child disability was not because of her sins and not because of her God's mistake. She continued, if you did not have a Joseph then, you would not have organized our group. And we would not have heard the gospel. Stephanie, I think Joseph is a missionary. When I heard those words, I was very shocked because when I pregnant of Joseph, my husband and I had prayed together that God would raise my son to be a pastor or a missionary. But we had never talked to anybody because of his disabilities. And even I had forgotten that I had prayed this prayer. Now God spoke to me through a new believer. I realized that this was an answer to my prayer. God had great plans for Joseph. He still struggled with autism and epilepsy, but I gave thanks to God that Joseph was now living according to God's plan, God's purpose. I was so proud of him. And also I can recall another very interesting instance. A few years later, when I took Joseph with me to a homeless support center, I drove to Hastings Street in Vancouver, where there is a um, large population of homeless people. I stopped, looked for the uh, name of the building, but suddenly Joseph left the car. And then uh, he directly to, went to the group of the uh, people, which included uh, alcoholics and drug addicts. I was just so scared, but Joseph walked up to them fearlessly. He stopped in front of the homeless man and held out his hand. Hi, my name is Joseph. What is your name? He talked very slowly. I just stood there and watched. There seemed to be an awkward moment, silence because between Joseph and, me, Joseph and our homeless man. A few seconds later, a smile appeared on the man's face. He extended his hands and told him his name. Then Joseph returned to me with radiant glow. He had completed his mission. This homeless man continued to smile as he watched Joseph return to me. It made me think, yes, Joseph, that was the heart of Jesus. I tend to distinguish people and judge them based on their looks and social status. But Joseph, you would hold out the hands to anyone without prejudice. The man would undoubtedly sit on the street all day. Would anyone else talk to him or cause him to smile? I said, Joseph, you are the best. I gave him thumbs up as he walked back to me. He was a true blessing to me and others in despite of his disabilities. In our lives, there are moments of great happiness, but as we all know, there are also moments unexpected, unplanned hardships strikes us down. About six years ago, I faced the most challenging situation. My son Joseph passed away at the age of 32. He drowned while swimming in the local public pool. He had suffered a seizure. And although there were lifeguards nearby, 
They seemed unaware of Joseph's struggles in the water. I could not believe what had happened. Koreans have seen that when parents die, we bury them in the ground. But the child dies, we bury them in our heart. Ever since Joseph passed away, my body and soul have felt heavy, like a sponge soaked in in the water. I felt dead. In the depths of my despair, passing through the deepest tunnel of grief, I could only reach out to God. I prayed with all my heart. I was crying out and seeking and finding God. Then by God's grace, despite of my extreme grief, I could experience the presence of God. One Sunday morning, about a month later, Joseph passed away. During praise and worship time, I had a remarkable experience. In the middle of the praising time, I suddenly heard a sound like a booming sound, booming voice. The voice touched my ears and my heart and my whole body. I heard the phrase, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. At that very moment, like lightning, I was struck by the memory of the verse, well-known verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I felt Jesus' blood, blood anointing on my head. I was able to see the cross of Jesus. I had known John 3, 16 all my life, but I knew it only from memory, not from my heart. I was suddenly reminded that Jesus Christ had suffered on the cross. He was tortured in front of the mocking and insulting crowd because of my sin. In essence, God crucified for my service for my salvation because he loved us so much. Tears flowed uncontrollably down my face. I felt the burning love of God. After that, I realized even the pain of my son's death was decreasing. Although Joseph is dead, he gained back his life because of the cross. Eventually, we all die, but as believers, because of the cross, we have eternal life. Soon after, my husband and I were able to embark on the coffee shop venture that would create employment opportunities for people with uh, different abilities. We named the coffee shop Joe's Table, Joyce from Joseph. Peace from the cross, Abel. So because of the cross, we are Abel. So we hired some employees with disabilities and some without disabilities. Now I want to show video clips about Joe Stable in Canada. Please. A new coffee shop in Burnaby is serving a lot more than hot drinks. The owners are making a special effort to hire people with disabilities. As CDB's Peter Granger explains, it all started with a mother's love for a lost son. Medium roast or dark roast? At first glance, this Burnaby coffee shop seems just like any other, until you start noticing details. Like the phrase printed on the walls, Hi, how are you? My name is Joseph. That would be the late Joseph Chung. Joe's table is named after him. He loves greeting people. So uh, I thought we can give a job for the greeter at the coffee shop because he likes to meeting people and socialize people. Joseph had autism and epilepsy. Last fall at age 32, he died suddenly in an accident. His parents, Stephanie and Peter Chung, decided to open Joe's table anyway and have made hiring people with differing abilities a priority. 
Nice to meet you, Jihad. This is Jian's first day of work ever. He's being trained as a barista. Jian shared the first hot chocolate he's ever made with his mom. You really made this by yourself? Thank you so much. It's great. It tastes so good. <laughs> I'm very, very happy that he can work here. Um, um, I hope he likes it. The owners have also set up an art gallery inside for specially challenged folks. Their artwork is available for sale. When customers discover just how special Joe's table is, they're impressed. Uh, equal opportunity for everybody. That's the way it should be. <laughs> equal opportunity for everyone. I wouldn't see it any different. It just has a very heartwarming story behind Joe. So now we have uh, Joe's table on one in Canada, two in Korea and a one uh, in North Carolina in uh, Billy Graham's library. I believe Joseph will be very happy in heaven and seeing his friends use their skills. God's grace has turned pain into God's glory. I will end my speech here today. It is not easy for me to speak about my late son. But I want to share my testimony as much as possible because I am the witness to a message of the cross and God's eternal love. I hope and pray that you, you hear me in this place. As struggling on your journey, remember you are not alone. God is with you. Nothing is by accident. God has a good plan for you. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all. Nothing is an accident. No one is an accident. Our pains oftentimes are, are allowed by God so that he can use it for his glory, so he can use it for his plans. And oftentimes we forget, don't we? And we get so mired in it. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus sat with this group of people. He says, there, there are going to be times when you keep thinking that the only value that I have, the only reason why I exist is because I am able. But Jesus reminded them back then, he reminds us now, it's not because of our ability. It's not because of our righteousness, but but because precisely we are unable, we are not righteous in of, our, of ourselves, but because of the cross, because of what Jesus did, that we are loved and valued and given purpose. <laughs>